up, get out right out of your bed, that's your quicksand. Getting rid of anxiety in head, you can fix it. Rid of stigmas, all of them you said, we ain't listening. Just remember, try to do your best, you can win this. Maurice Bernard, state of mind. Okay, here we are. State of mind. Different studio. I'm not going to get into what happened. There's no need. <laughs> but <laughs> forget it. Um, listen, I want to, I wanna, you know, every time I do state of mind, it's pretty much, especially in the beginning, I talk about things that are happening in my life and whatnot. A couple weeks ago, I got the flu, and it hit me pretty bad. I took a bath, and when I got out of the bath, I couldn't walk. I almost fell down, and I was shaking like a leaf. And the last time I was shaking like that was during the pandemic with anxiety. So it kind of threw me. And that night, I got through it that, that period of shaking, but that night I started shaking again. This time I couldn't, it, it, it didn't stop. So, you know, being mentally ill or not, uh, maybe other people also, my mind starts going through a lot of different things. So uh, I went to the emergency and they just said that I had uh, influenza, okay? Cool, I have influenza. It's the flu. Went home. Well, I think that triggered anxiety. And also knowing I had to go to work on Monday, five shows. I had to do five shows. So my mind started playing a lot of tricks on me, and that's what happens, as you guys know, anybody who lives with uh, anxiety. And, you, you know, it's like your, your, your mind is so powerful that I started telling myself, I can't do it. I'm not going to be able to work all week the way I'm feeling. I didn't want my wife, now I'm getting emotional. I didn't want my wife to leave the house because it scared me. I don't know if it scared me because of what I thought that I could do to myself or whatever it was, but it scared me. And I thought, you know, I got I to gotta work all week, and then I got state of minds that are very important. <laughs> uh, and I said, there's just no way I can do it. But listen, people telling you right now, no matter how difficult you think it is, no matter how much you say you can't do it, you can do it. You make the impossible in your mind possible. And let me tell you, it wasn't easy. I went to work, man, and crying times, crying here, there. But I got through the week, and here I am doing my state of mind and I'm at, a, I'm at about 85% better. We can do it, people. We think it's, it's the most impossible thing. In the world. It's not. Just keep moving forward. Do what you got to do. Don't, I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. I took some Xanax to sleep because I wasn't sleeping. So I took some Xanax. Uh, I got my friend hypnotized me a couple times. And I just didn't allow my mind to really go down that road. Anyway, okay. Oh, it feels good to get it out. Uh, I have somebody here today. Not only is she talented, great, the whole thing, the fact that, because of what happened yesterday, this just tells me a lot about this person. She did something yesterday for me, and that's why she's here right now, 
that, you know, it's it's not it seems like not a big deal, but to me it's a big deal. And it go, goes to show you who she is, how kind she is. And I really, really, my my wife also really appreciates it. Okay. Um, <laughs> her name is Martha Byrne. How are oh, you? Oh, what a nice introduction. Uh, well, Thank you. you it's, it's so great to be here right now, I got to tell you. It's great to be here with you, too. Wow. And we got to talk yesterday a bit. Yeah, we had a great talk. Which was talk. nice. Yes. Because we didn't know each other that at no, all, really. We've no. crossed paths a few times, but not no actual exchanges of life no. stuff. Even though I was on GH for like a second, we never crossed paths. We never crossed paths. You were the, was I tried to kill Edward Quartermain and uh, yeah, way I was back. the mayor's wife. I got hit by a. I was at the the carnival. And got we, hit by impaled by a car and died in the in front of a Ferris wheel. I don't know where you are. You weren't invited to. Uh, the, maybe to I was be, killing yeah. somebody. You may have been off somewhere else. You yes, know, or in yes, jail or, or in jail. But that's the thing. We just we didn't cross paths then. But wow. And did we? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But I want to. I want to get. I want to get to know you from the beginning. Okay. Like if you and I were on a lunch date together for the first time, <laughs> okay. and I would ask you, "So where are you from, Jersey?" Jersey, right? yes. How was that? It's the best. I mean, come on, what's better than Jersey? I was raised by a, my mother was a research biologist teacher. She was my manager when I was a child actor. I was in Annie on Broadway when I was ten. Right, that's, right. That's where I started my career, and my dad was a tree surgeon and worked hard, blue collar guy, and. We had a very, and then my mom was a school teacher. So when I was doing work films, when I was a child actor, my mother was tutoring me. So I had it. I was the youngest of four, so I was the baby, and I had great. And siblings. nobody else was acting. Nope. I just went to an open audition for Annie on Broadway with eight hundred little girls and got into Broadway show. Out of two people got cast, myself and the girl who played Annie got cast. But I was the only one who got cast from the open call with eight hundred little girls. I mean, I just went. I wanted but to do why? it. But why? Because oh, you I were so. To, you were I loved. I just natural? wanted to be it. I just wanted to be on stage. I just was a ham bone, you know. Like I, I just, I did one little performance when I was a kindergarten, where I had to hold like a card, you know, announcing each grade, and I heard the applause, and I went, "Wow, this is uh, this is good. I like this. I'm not doing anything." And, and how old were you? When I was Annie, I was I auditioned when I was nine, and I got on the show when I was ten, like right when my birthday, my tenth birthday. How 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 were your nerves at that? No have- nerves. No nerves. I, I nerves came much later in my life. You know, I was not. I wasn't afraid of anything. We performed for the president. We were. I mean, you know, you look back now, and I think as a t- having children, to be ten, my mother and my father must have been a wreck on opening wow. night. You know, like oh, she's gonna be okay. And well, you didn't have fear. Fear wasn't something that was part of my DNA at that point. You know, whether it was age or it was just because I really had the the thrill of the theater in my bones, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, that with child actors, they have it. Then the ones that don't have that, their careers are very short, right? They kind of right. do it for the parents. They do it because they, they're the breadwinner for the family. I didn't have that issue. My parents said, anytime you want to quit, you can quit. Just do it for fun. You know, you're, you loving it. And they supported me a hundred percent, which was very, uh, it was, was incredible that my parents, cause my mom, my mom was a full-time teacher and had to kind of put that aside and, and help me and, Really? She let me follow my dreams, and it, it was pretty. So unselfish. from Annie, what was after that? I did a lot of movies, a lot of t- TV films, and pilots, and and then I got on Azrael Turns when I was fifteen. So that was, you know, I was already a seasoned veteran by that point in the business when I got on Azrael Turns. Oh, you were fifteen when you got Azrael. Now you know. Yeah. I was a fan of you and John John Henson. Yeah, right? yes, of course. You yeah. guys look so great. To, you guys had chemistry. We man. did. We did. Hey, right. You know what? We never dated. That's probably the part. Of, plus, I was he was a lot older than me. Yeah. And that was the storyline. You know, it was yeah. like this young girl that was kind of in love with the older guy, stable boy. You know, didn't wear shirts a lot. He had a sh- him, um, <laughs> and. It was very genuine. You know, we, we was I genuinely was so enamored of him as a teenage girl, like everybody else Good in America. Good looking dude, man. Good looking dude. Didn't have to say much. No. Kind of had a huff towards you. Yeah. <laughs> kind of grunted but a lot. But it didn't yeah. matter. Didn't matter. I did. I played baseball with him. I think. Okay. Really. You're like that's a good looking guy. Yeah. yeah You're yeah. like I'm a good looking guy, but that guy, 
No, he you know, the nose, the chiseled, the chin, the whole, the whole thing. package. And what was, happened to him? He was. He's still around. He doesn't act anymore. But he, we were there. To, we worked together for twenty years, back and forth. So, Wait a minute. Yes. You worked with. Yes. How long were you on? Twenty years. So I left for a little bit. I left in eighty nine and then came back in ninety three. So then I was there for until two thousand eight. So I was there a long time, and we worked together. John and I worked together off and on for. That whole time, we were always with other actors. I mean, I worked with so many actors. I worked yeah. with Ken, Ken Schreiner came on the show. I'm and played sorry. my <laughs> One of my favorite years on the show. We had so much fun. I loved him. Um, but I worked with some great guys on the show. I had wow. great co I had great co-stars that I worked with for every guy that I worked with on As the World Turns was a, a, a great human being and actor. And, and who was, were the, at the main, like the head, head actors? Like, like Elizabeth Hubbard. Larry Brigman. Oh, Larry Brig. Larry Brigman. He's a, he's from the actor studio. He sure he was incredible. So a lot of those actors in New York were all theater actors that just kind of did the soap stuff as their day job, and then they were off doing Broadway shows. So to grow up in that atmosphere with those ta that talent and to be around that every day really changed my. I became an actor when I went on Azrael Turns, like a real actor when I went to. And Azrael then Turns. what? How did it? How did it end? Did, I was 19 and I wanted to leave and come out here. I was here for four years in L.A. And I did a lot of TV pilots and I did a lot of TV movies. And, you know, it just wasn't, I just, this this town was was kind of eating me alive in a sense that I was a homebody where I liked to be around my family and it was kind of petering out here, like, you know, you're hot for a while, yeah. you're working, yeah. and then all of a sudden it's like two weeks go by, you don't have an audition, three weeks go by, then another I audition. get you, yeah. And then I called Douglas Marlin, who had been the head writer of As the World Turns, who, I, who was wonderful to me. He was, he, he was, had been an actor. So he, when I left As the World Turns, he totally understood why I wanted to go do other things. And Days of Our Lives had called for me to audition, and I called Douglas and I said, I said, what do you think about Days of Our Lives? It's in LA. He goes, are you thinking about going back to soaps? I said, yeah. He goes, hold the hold the line, basically. Like, if you're going to come back to a soap, I want you to come back to As the World Turns. So I auditioned for days, did not get it. And within like 24 hours, I was back to New York kind of going on As the World Turns. So, you know, I don't know what happened. It worked out for the best because if I had gotten on Days of Our Lives, I I don't think I would have lasted very long there. I feel like I was my heart was already back right. east. Right. And, and then I met my husband the weekend I got back <laughs> The weekend I got back to New York, I met my husband that weekend, and we've been together for 30 years. So that was fate. Wow. Yeah. And, and then I stayed till 2008, as a world turned. But now, after. were you there when it got uh, canceled? No, I left, I left a few years prior to that, which was a very difficult decision for me to go, but it was time. Um, all the signs were there for me to, to move on. You know, yeah. it wasn't, you know, look, I, I feel like it was. A, I, I, w I had the best story. I had the, I had, I had done everything I wanted to do on that show. And I played twins for four years. You know, I, I, I really, and it, it just became an environment that I felt was detrimental to my own kind of future. You know, wow. it really did. Yeah. It really did. Nothing. It, it was just time to go. I loved everybody that I worked with. But 20 years is time to go. It was just time to go. My daughter was born early when my third child and she was in ICU for two weeks and she was, you know, she was really difficult, her birth. And after that, I never quite was wanted to go back to work again. I wanted to be home with her. I felt like this real instinct to just be around her and, and the commute was, was really difficult. And I, I wanted to be a mom and I wanted to be home. And I felt like I've been working since I was 10 years old consistently. I had been, you know, nobody leaves a soap opera unless you can. Let's yeah. put it that way. You know, like okay, yeah. like it's a great job. Uh, it's a great paying job. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's all the good things yes. that as an actor wants. But for me, I wanted to be more of a presence in my children's life than I had been before. Um, and my husband had been injured on. We'll call, talk about that a little bit later. But he had been injured as a police officer and was retired. So. On disability, he would he would broke his hip and he broke, but he was doing well. Like he was he was the stay at home dad while I was working playing twins and I was doing these crazy schedules. So he was home with the kids, yeah. which was wonderful yeah. for their father to be yeah. with their kids. And you know he he taught 
he did all the coaching with the kids and football and baseball and soccer. He did right. every sport for every, you know, he was great. So for him, it was, it was wonderful to be able to be home with the kids. But then, then I said, 2008, I was, it was time for me to, and I wanted to write. I was writing. I, do, you, I, do you, do you feel like, cause you know, I'm getting close to that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like creatively, like, see, my, my, here's my fear. Mm. Get into a little bit of mental health. My fear is just like what happened recently, and it's happened quite a lot in the past. I got to have an outlet, man. Yeah. Because I can't just be at home. You know, almost it's almost like the work fixes me it's not almost it's it does <laughs> you're right it does it does i know but then again martha there are times when i work so much or whatever and yeah, i'm like i'm done with this you're, shit. You're burned out yeah right right but then i think this reminds me no no you need now if i could do this mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that would mm -hmm, be mm -hmm. creative it's outlet different it is it's, different. It's, you're playing a character who's, you know, you get to escape into that space. And, you know, Elizabeth Hubbard, God rest her soul, you know, she would talk about how as actors, you know, you know, trying being a teenager and going to work every day and having to be able to spill your guts on camera for the world. It was great because you could get out all those emotions that most teenagers feel that they can't right. express. Right. And I could express it. And other people and kids would it, would be able to identify with it and go, that's real. What right. she's feeling, that's what I feel every day. Right. And we do that as actors. And you can never be, put that, the fact that our audience goes, I was suffering with cancer and you I guys got it. us through that. You know, you, you, I could escape with you. And like, they could escape with us because we were escaping into those roles. And we were fighting so hard to make it real and make it, a, and, and hitting us in, in, the, yeah. in the gut. You know, and so you made up a, you brought up a very good point that that outlet to be able to emote and sh and dig and and yeah. clean it out. I mean, clean yeah. out all the the cobwebs that most people walk through their lives and can't do that. It's unaccepted. Yeah. You can't do. You can't just let it all out because they'll think you're you know you're what's wrong with no, you. It's you like, can't. No, you no. Know. So we we but but I'm glad you asked that question. It's like I don't miss that. I don't See, miss. That's beautiful. I don't miss that ability because I know it's there. I can rely on it if I need it in my own life. I can tap into it if I need to tap into it for my own life. But playing other characters and other roles are so wonderful because you can get into their psyche and you can ex and you can dive and lose yourself in it for that time and then close the door and go home and kind yeah. of like leave it at the studio. You know, there's a lot of that with with what we do, especially with we so people. Yeah, because you get to just. Oh, unload your, you know, every leave everything on the field. You know, it's like yeah. a great football player. Like they walk out with their, blo you know, bloody. Blah, blah, blah. Like my father was a uh, college football player. I mean, I look at pictures of him. He, you know, they had no helmets back then. They had, you know, <laughs> they had leather helmets with tube socks stuck in there, and it's like, you know, but they left it all on the field. So like a athletes are like that too, or like actors too. It's yeah. like they, they leave it. They 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 just let loose and leave it. You know, but you have to know when you still need it, and you have to, and not put it to bed until it's time. And for me, it, it because creatively it wasn't giving me anything anymore, See, which is sad in a sense. But it was time; like it was just yeah. it was it was done. It was it was. I didn't, I didn't feel like it was there was anything left for me to do on the field there, and it was it was a difficult place to work at that time for me, for me, for my own personal reasons. And, and John was sweet. John was great. John was amazing. I mean, we were star-crossed lovers on TV for 20-plus years. I didn't know it was 20. Yes, Damn it. yes, yeah, 20-plus years. And they never got together ever at the end. Like, they never closed that door oh, for those re characters. No, they replaced me. I, they recast me when I left, and then they never put them kind of back together again after that. It was kind of an unfinished business story at the end. Which is, yeah, yeah. And that's in the, and, and in those days, that's when the Emmys were great. And they were great. Let me tell you something. I don't know if anybody knows this. I'm <laughs> talking to the audience out there. My first, the first time I heard your name was at Radio oh, City yeah. 
the entire building shook when they <laughs> said your name. If your face came on screen, it was mayhem. And we were talking about this the other night, like the, the whole streets would be shut down. Oh, guys, I'm great. Tens of thousands yeah. of people screaming. Like they just it were. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was, and then you would come on screen and everybody would just it go nuts. Pe- what was that like? I'm going to interview you for a second. What did that feel like? Because that never happened. Well, well I, I did start, when I went to the Amsterdam, there's a lot of oh, fans. Yeah, they, love the, they love As a World Thursday. Yeah. But tell me about your, well, you how know, that f- felt. For me, it, I had to be with two under, uh, cops that yeah. had guns. Good. And, well, that's my people. So Yeah, good. right. <laughs> and, there, and, and I walk in and it was crazy. And then people started like grabbing me in places. But I had my daughter, and it got oh, scary because oh, 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 oh. they're grabbing and they're grabbing kind of her a little bit, and I'm like, I'm walking down the thing, and the the detective or whatever it was said he he's been to the Oscars, the, <laughs> he's never seen anything no. like the soap I it. fans, and then and then a lot of times that I would go, I and the winner is not Maurice, <laughs> <laughs> and like whoop whoop. <laughs> But then, and but then you did. Then so the you, one that yeah. I won was incredible. Yes, and, uh, of course. But now, like, the one, I won another one, and it was, like, uh, streaming. Oh, oh. And then I won another one, and I and I was at home watching. You were watching. at home. <coughs> right, yeah. yeah. So it's not the same. No, but you got to experience it. Yes, which you is, did. You were, it's a very, I can't explain it to anybody who's actually listening to this to know and then they would say your name, and they would say, you know, somebody from Bazaar Turn saying, hey. yeah, right, because we were we were more of a southern kind of show. But New York was ABC town; it was ABC town, like that was yeah, big, yeah. big time. So it was uh, it was something to be seen, and we had such wonderful experiences, right? We got to we got to it be. It was amazing. It was, ama- it was truly, truly amazing. On the streets, everybody yeah, blocked the streets off in Manhattan. I mean, that was, and they had a red carpet coming from the Sheridan. All the way to Radio City. Yeah, I mean, nothing, yeah. nothing like that. Nothing. And no. unless you've experienced it, you don't really know. No. What, let's talk about your. But I want to talk about your childhood. What mm-hmm. was that like? Like when you went to school, what kind of of a girl were you? Well, I had. I went to Catholic school. No mental health. No. At all. No, I mean, I think I was very fortunate. That's in fortunate this, in this business to be a child actor and not have suffered from that. Either the the, I think they I like most kids either go into it because their parents want them to go into it or because they have a a, a talent like they just have an undeniable talent that someone points out and they throw them into this you know this business. I I truly loved the the the, the experience of performing, and my pa- I had like had a very normal life outside of that though. Like, my, like I said, my mother was a teacher, my my dad was a tree surgeon. We lived very modestly. Uh, come from a very blue collar town yeah. uh, and I went to Catholic school and I had my uniform and I had like I went to school all remember I went to Broadway's at night so I was in school all day long and then I would go to the, the theater and Allison Smith who was Annie on Broadway she li- she was my neighbor we lived across the street from each other so we commuted together every day we're Jeez. still wonderful friends and I would come home at 11 o'clock at night go to school the next day and then go back and do it again and I I couldn't get enough of it I mean, I couldn't, I, I was so, it was a high that I didn't know how to even express what that feeling was to perform on Broadway and people, and we had famous people would come see us and president, like I said, it was. What president? It was Reagan, Ronald Reagan. No. That's how far back we're going here. That's amazing yes. though. Yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, every, we had, it, it, it was you should actors. You met him and stuff? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's not amazing. How was it? That was a brief. It was more like a this, you know. Oh, yeah, they're, they don't really very very protective. So it was. I yeah. Am ready. Oh no no no! It was we. They didn't really want anything to do with us. It was always about the the lead actress, you know, who was Annie. She met all the presidents who girl played Annie Allison Smith. She was at the White House several times, um, but so to have that life experience, so young, so many girls never worked after that. Annie girls. They never had that high again. They, their true. careers That's ended true. right after that. Yeah. And I was, I kept doing movies and was very f- fortunate that way. But I was very protected. My mother was always with me. 
my mom was never always by my side wherever I would travel. And, and um, I never felt vulnerable. You know, I always felt like I was protected so many, that, yeah, when, yeah. which is, you know, looking back now, you go, wow, well, I was very, I was very, um, the, the message was very clear that my mother was always by my side and very tough, my mother. What do you attribute child actors just, their lives ruined because the love that you get from the audience isn't they want it forever ah you know i'm reading a book right now and it's it's exactly what you just said mm. called the uh, ego is your enemy mm. isn't that the truth and that's what what you just said that's what that is yeah especially for a child who can't express that they don't know what that is. They don't know what ego is. They right. just know everybody's giving you free things and they're they're fawning all over you and they're taking your picture. You're going to the White House. You know what I'm like? Who does yeah. They want that. Why would you, why do you want not want me to do that now? Why, well, now that I'm older, why am I not wanted anymore? Why is my talent not enough anymore? Why am I not getting auditions anymore? Why is my parents mad at me because I'm not making any money? See, there's, I didn't have any of that. To me, it was, what, what 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 did you the, your well first of all I think you you were born like my son who's a great, incredible actor with did you, you don't care what people think I did not Yee! no still don't I know you don't <laughs> still don't it's a beautiful thing it's the greatest thing that I I'm working on it and I'm much better it's, now yeah but I forever cared so much yeah and I always had nerves and everything you were born or maybe because your parents the way they brought you up you don't have that that's no. amazing and, and when getting on the soap opera at 15 I was always treated as a peer by my actor other actors on the show Elizabeth Hubbard was you know one of the most successful daytime stars ever and the doctors and she played my mother Lisa Brown, who played my mother, was on Broadway star. Bill Fickner, who's now everybody knows Bill Fickner. He's on ton, tons of films and television. He played my father. There was no, they never treated me less than. So I felt like I was on stage with my peers, even though mm -hmm. I was a green. You know, they treated me and, and helped me and taught me. But they never talked down to me and they never treated me le less than. So I got confidence I, my confidence was very h high because of the interactions I had with my other actors on the show. Elizabeth Hubbard, you know, who, you know, she, the second I started working with her, I was not good when I first started on Astro Turns. I had been hired quickly from a tape because the other actress left, so they recast her. And from day one, she always treated me with respect and also wanted my input. She opened all the doors in my creative brain and wanted to help me. Right. So I never felt like I was judged. I never, I was encouraged. I built my confidence so that I'd be fearless as an actor, which made me fearless in my life. So I, I not just my parents, obviously, because my parents did not stroke my ego at all. Oh, they didn't? No, no, no. I, know, I was just the fourth child. That's good. Yeah. Which was great. You know, everybody enjoyed the what I did, my pe yeah. my siblings and everything. We I took always took them to the Emmys. I always took my entire family to the Emmys. To me, it was a shared experience, and they were proud of me. But they were never jealous, and there was never any wow. of that. Yeah, I'm very blessed that way. To this day, I mean, there's still we are still like a tight unit. My sisters and my brother, all four of us are are tight, and my mother. You know, my mother negotiated all my contracts at As the World Turns. She was my my manager. She was my protector. She was, um, she just was, a lot of momagers are not those people. They, it's about them. Yeah, it's about what yeah. they can get out of it. You know, the, the star, you know, the celebrity aspect. My mother didn't care, couldn't care less about, she never wanted to be in a picture with me. She didn't want to, you know, it was not about her. I think there's a great lesson for parents in this is that, you need to, if you have a creative child, never belittle that. Never say you can't. Can you imagine if my mother said, you can't audition with 800 girls for Broadway? You haven't had a singing lesson. Yeah, You've never yeah, had a yeah. dancing lesson. Who do you think you are? She was like, all right, you can go. Right. And I get right. the job and then her life changes. But I'm saying is that she embraced that 
creative space in my mind that I needed to explore. She didn't know what it meant because she didn't have that background, but she knew that I had talent because, and no fear. So she's like, put her out there and see what she can do. And, and I, I landed the job and then her life changed. Everybody's life changed, but it was wonderful. I was very, I was very, I'm still blessed. Well, I think you, you know, uh, that comp, that, that confidence that not caring what people think. Cause I, I have a thing of, uh, with mental health that a lot of the people that are, have mental health care about what people think. I get it though. Cause I've asked a lot of people. Yeah. Like my wife doesn't care what people think. Yeah. She has no mental health. My son, no mental health, you know, and then people I've asked, they say, yeah, I care about what people think they're, they have some yeah. mental health. So it's, there's a correlation there. I don't think it's, I don't, I think especially in our industry, you're constantly judged by other people that you don't realize you're being judged, right? Like it's happening behind you, walk out of a, a makeup room or something and you know the hair room, it's like there's somebody's making a crack, you know? Right. And it's like, that's just part of the, that's part of the game. It doesn't mean that you are that or you are, you know, less than. It's just, I've seen insecurities in actors and it's totally understandable. I get it. I understand where it comes from. Yes. I totally understand. I just didn't, because I grew up, I think also in the eighties on television where they didn't care about my, what I, my, how much I weighed. They didn't care about my teeth. They didn't care about my skin. They didn't care about it. That was not an issue back then. Oh, Nobody, yeah. there was no social media. You know, it was just, you were an actor. You were an actor yeah. and you were acting. Yeah. It didn't matter. And I didn't worry about my physical, what I looked like physically, um, was never brought up. Never once was I ever told lose weight. Never in all the years I was on As The World Turns was I ever told ever told about anything physical about my, 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 myself ever. Yeah. So that made me, that was off the table then. You know, yeah. I didn't have to think about that. It yeah. was just cause I didn't care either way. It was like, I'm, I'm going to have babies and I'm going to get big and I'm not going to pretend that I'm not, that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a mom and that's important to me to just be healthy and eat and you know, I'll, I'll get it off later. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't a part of our, wasn't a part of our shows, uh, overall, and you um, still went to high school when you? I did. I went to Catholic high school, so I would go to as you. Yeah, so I do Catholic school in the morning. My mother would pick me up. I go to the city. She'd drop me off and let me go in. When I was like a teenager, I would go in and work for a couple of hours, and then she'd come and pick me up and take me home. And then I got my license, and she was so happy when I got my license because then I could go into the by myself. And now the kids in the school were they like, oh, you're her. well. They loved John Hensley, who played Holden. They wanted to know all about the boys. They didn't care about me. They're like, what's it like to kiss John Hensley, Brian Bloom? Do you remember him? I, I'm friends with Brian mm. Bloom. Yeah, he was my boyfriend, my first boyfriend on As the World Turns. Him and John were my two triangle guys. <laughs> Tri me, that sounds really bad. But that, that is, <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was just Brian sweet. is yeah. a great writer. He's amazing. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a thousand years. but my I got a story about Brian. We were in... Acting class and Howard Fine's oh, acting I remember. Class. I took a couple classes. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. And we did a scene together, and I wasn't good. And it screwed me. And then everybody came up to him and said, can you do a scene with me? And nobody came up to me. Oh. And it messed me up, right? So I had to do the same scene. It was American Buffalo. Uh, without you know and so we we're gonna do a saturday so brian comes to the house and i'm gone yeah yeah yeah. i'm gone you're you're, you're questioning you're, yourself every right, second every yeah i'm terrible yeah so he comes over and he goes i said i don't know if i'm gonna be able to do the scene brian he goes why what do you mean i go i'm not feeling well i'm sick i was lying it, was, it wasn't sick he goes yeah your eyes seem you don't have that fire in your eyes I said, I don't think I'll be able to make it. So that night, I don't think I've told this story. It's amazing. That night, I said to Paula, we're on the bed. I said, I think I, I give up. Mm. And I had a tear coming down. Mm. And I, I wasn't one to give up because I, I am fragile when it comes to mental health. But when it comes to career or acting, I can. And I said, I, I can't do it, baby. She goes, you can do it. I said, no. I said, I don't think I'll be able to do that scene tomorrow with Brian. I don't want to get. So 
I would go to sleep, wake up, go get a beer, drink a beer. I'm not saying that's a good thing. <laughs> and I'm in class, and I'm running lines with Brian, and, it, and I can't remember a line. Mm. I said, Brian, I don't think I can do it. And then I said to Howard, I don't think I'm doing the scene. He goes, yes, you are. That's the, you know, that's Brian, that's uh, Howard for you. So I'm waiting to do the scene. I'm like one up. My hands are shaking. I'm just, you know, nervous. And all of a sudden, I'm praying to God, man. God, please help me. Just let me do this scene. Just let me do this scene. All right, Maurice and Brian, you're doing American Buffalo. Let's go. So I get up. And something hit me like I'm possessed, man. Hey, Bobby, you fucking roast me, you know. Hey, babe, a fucking roast me sandwich. Let's go. I didn't stop, man. Like, choo. <laughs> you just beamed in. Yeah, beamed in. <laughs> and Brian's like, what the fuck? He's a good actor. He's man. amazing. Yeah. He's amazing. He's, he's amazing. So he was just like, okay, he's on it. And afterwards, I was like a peacock, you know. Yeah. And Howard's like, you feel good about yourself, huh? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, but... Nobody knows what's going on in someone's life. No. Like that could have been. Mm. Mm. If I didn't do well in that scene, Martha. We wouldn't be sitting here probably. Probably not. Right. I, I would have gone back to all my children, which I don't say that's a failure. But to me, I didn't want to do a soap at the time. I was right, that, right, that, right. To go back to New York is kind of that I gave up here. So it goes to show you again. When you think you can't do something. And the thing between your ears is the thing telling you you can't. Shut it shut yeah, it off. It just, shut it down. You're pat more you're stronger than that voice. Yeah, you, you know, I got head. a t shirt that says you're because I it says you're stronger than you know. Yeah. Because that's what I that's what my wife would say to me when I'm messed up. She'd say you're stronger than you know. And I'm yeah. like, Okay, honey. It's in there. Um, it's in there. All right, now we're going to talk about real life, as they say. Yes. Real let, life. Let, just let me, let me brief the audience here on what, what's going to go down here We're in, with, with Martha. This isn't the movies. This is real life. It, it, what you could be put through and what you have to endure is bullshit, really. Um, and I'm gonna let her tell the. I'm gonna let her tell the whole story because she's, she says it wonderfully. Um, so, let's talk about your case mm -hmm. and what happened. Well, first of all, what I want to no. First of all, I want I want to know all about your husband. Yeah. I want to get into how you met. Yeah. How you dated. Yeah. What happened. <laughs> He's cool, the whole thing. <laughs> He's super cool. Okay, so I married, I married a real life hero. So I mean, I, I don't say that lightly, but I, I had come back from as the world turns. I mean, come back to go back to as the world turns, and I met him the first first night I went out with my girlfriend, and he was. I knew he was Irish because his name was McMahon, oh. and I'm Byrne, and I'm 100 percent Irish. I'm like, he's a really good looking guy, and me, I'm not shy. I don't know if you figured that out already. Yes. I and uh, so I went right up to him and, and he had just lost his sister and his father had just passed away like six weeks before I, in the same month. Oh. So he was really, you know, in a bad, bad, you know, he was emotionally in a bad place. He was so close to his sister. She was only a year uh, older than him and they were like best friends. And my friend who said he was coming, who was a, he was a relative of, of her, her brother-in-law anyway, she goes... She filled me in. She said he just lost his father and his his sister and and uh and how old was he? Twenty five. Oh yeah. 25. So we were young. So he was or twenty four even. I was twenty two. And um I went right up to him and we I just introduced myself and we were we bought a house six months within six months we had were engaged and bought a house together and I just knew it. I just knew he was the guy. Like he was just as real. He was a New York City police officer. Um, he had been, he took the New York police test when he was 16 years old. 
Like he knew he wanted, this is what he wanted to do with his life. So when I met him, he had already been on the the force for a couple of years and he was in a a unit called the street crime unit, which was an anti-crime unit that was started by Rudy, Rudy Giuliani to really break down crime patterns all in all five boroughs. So Mm. if there was a pattern of robbery, these guys went in plain clothes and cleaned up how cleaned house gun sales. They go in drugs. They go in midtown go in. So like my husband was in a, uh, a shooting in times square on new year's Eve where someone was robbing a store with, with AK 47s. My husband was part of a shooting (laughs) through the windows back and forth, like the wild, wild west in times square on new year's Eve. And he called me and said, I'm going to be on the news 11 o'clock. I said, oh, because I was home by myself on New Year's Eve. Yeah, there was a shooting. I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, but just want to let you know that it's going to be on the news. So, of course, I turned the news on, and there he is in Times Square. Uh, his partner was shot. He was okay. So this was our life when we first got married. He was heavily involved in some major, major shootings and uh, you know cases that were trying to save New York. I mean, they this this organ, th- these guys were the top. They were handpicked, the top 200 New York City police officers in the entire force of 30,000 were picked. Damn. So he was no joke. I mean, it was it was serious. And he loved it. He loved it. And then he became a detective and he became a sergeant. So when he became a sergeant in the Bronx, he was in charge of 200 guys, I think. Um, and then he was also a school safety sergeant, which meant he was in charge of all the public and private schools in the Bronx to help s- literally save kids' lives. You know, really went in. They'd had That's beautiful. It really amazing. Like gangs, right? Getting the gangs out of the schools, recruitment. You know, drug dealers on the on the properties. He would cleaning that up. So he he was so uh, heavily involved in the Bronx, and it was the worst precinct in all of New York, which he worked. That's where he was. So he really changed a lot of people's lives in the Bronx. And then he was in a police chase. Uh, where a perp had beaten his girlfriend up so badly that he broke in both of her eye sockets. And he said, if a cop comes by, I'm going to shoot him. I'm going to kill him. And they came over the radio that this was this happened and this guy was threatening a cop. So if you're threatening a cop in New York City, you can still have a, you can still police, you can chase them. Because now they, they don't do that anymore because okay. they, you know, people are getting mowed down. And like, unless yeah. the guy's killed somebody or threatening a cop, then you can well, go. Well, a cop just got beat up by the four. Oh, uh, yeah. In Times Square. Yeah. yeah. It's um, it's so different now. The cops are so, they were so valuable, valued back in the time I when know. my husband was involved. And they were seen as safety for everybody. And my husband would say, people were happy to see us. You know who wasn't happy to see us? The bad guys. Bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't like to see us. But yeah. the neighborhood is like, oh, thank God you guys are here because we know we can go shopping. We're safe. You're taking guns off the street. You're taking, you know, you, you're cleaning up Times Square. You're cleaning up. Penn Station, they were cleaning up, they were helping people. Um, so when he went on this pl- call, he was in the passenger seat and they did had a police chase and it was on ABC News. At 50 miles an hour, he hits a telephone pole, my husband. No. Yes. Yep. Like an accordion, the car just goes whoosh, and he's in the passenger seat. So I knew, I think at that point I had saw, I had seen it on TV and he had someone had called me at the studio. I can't remember. It's all like a blur. But he would tell I remember him saying to me, if someone calls for me, I'm probably dead. Like I'm, you know, they don't call you with good news, as we'll get to later, right? They don't come to your house unless it's good, bad news. And it ended his career. He was broken, he had a broken hip. He broke part of ne- part of his neck. He um, was a m- absolute physical mess. And he had to retire from the police department, which at 25, well, he was at that point, he was 20, not, he had been on for 13 years. So was, he was in his thirties by then. Okay. So he had, he had a long but he career. Had to re- yeah. He was in his thirties when he had to retire from the police department, which killed him. I mean, he, he what left the department. What did it do to him he, like, mentally? He, it was horrible. So he had earned 75 uh, medals while he was on the police department. Oh my goodness. Combat cross rece- recipient, which was, was given to him by the mayor and the police commissioner. He had over a thousand arrests when he was on the police department. Um, wow. So he was devastated. He didn't even go pick up his gun and badge when he retired. He had his brother who was also a cop that was in the precinct do it for him because he was devastated. Like he, he really felt he didn't know what to do with, with his life because he had been doing that for so long and he didn't know anything else. 
And what did, what happened? Like when as soon as he had to retire, was he just laying around the house? How was yeah? He so he had depression? to go to re- re- rehabilitation, physical re- rehabilitation. But remember, I was working on the soap at the time. We had a little child. We had a little guy um, who was like, th- I guess, how old was Mikey then? I guess he was probably three or something. So you know, you can't wallow too much if you've got a three-year-old running around the house and I'm working and my mom's coming in trying to help and like he had yeah, to get up yeah, every right. day and go to physical therapy every day but and that I saw I saw him starting to become depressed about not working and and my friend Lisa Brown who played my one of my yeah. moms in as well turns her husband was a defense attorney and I said I got to do something to help him I'm like can you you know maybe maybe you're he needs some help at the office or I'm like he's such a brilliant mind he knows the criminal mind better than most people. Maybe there's something he could do with the, at the office. And she, of course, immediately, he's like, of course, we love Mike. He's amazing. So that change of his life when he started becoming a private investigator for defense attorneys completely changed the trajectory of his life. And he became one of the most sought after private investigators in the tri-state really? area. Right. So he's working for the, because he knows the criminal mind and lawyers loved that because Lawyers who sit, you know, and who kind of are the are the brainiacs of law, yeah, don't need don't really understand the street right, mind, right? Right. So they love guys like Mike who know the criminal's mind because when you're working for a defense attorney, a lot, of, you know, they're guilty a lot of times, but they're also innocent sometimes. So you want to make sure you, you get a guy who can investigate properly to make sure that you're getting every nuance of the crime. And he was great at that, and his business was doing great. And then I left as the world turns and I was home. So then his business was taking off. Mm. Okay. And I was home and I was writing and doing, I was writing for Bold and Beautiful for a little while. And I was doing more creative on the other side of the camera stuff. So everything was great. And then in 2016, he gets a phone call, a routine call. He's done about four or 500 cases at this point in his PI career for everything from homicides to he worked for, uh, I mean, any, anything you can imagine. He was, he was not just like the looking for the cheating husband PI, right? Yeah. What, what was he doing? What was this? Everything from insurance fraud to homicide to, uh, you know, there's some, there's a, again, when you're dealing with a defense attorney, the one thing he would never do, he would never work for someone who had molested a child or hurt a child that way. I was going to ask you about yep. child trafficking. He would never work for somebody. He would never take a case of a defendant who had committed a crime against a child like that. Yeah. He just wouldn't do that. Hell no. No. Yeah. It was not worth. He didn't. First of all, you know, again, we were again, we were very fortunate. We were financially in a great place. He loved what he did. He did it because he he loved it. And he did a lot of pro bono work, a lot of pro bono work for people who couldn't afford to pay for some, you know, a, a, a private investigator. And then in 2016, he got a phone call from a translation company in Queens, New York, saying that she had a client who had uh, was needed a PI, a licensed private investigator in New Jersey, to do some asset searches, some background checks on someone who had stolen money from this my client's construction company business. From but the, the construction company business was in China, but the man was here in New Jersey buying homes and cars and like they want to see where the money went. Yeah. He's worked on many cases like that where they steal yeah. money from a business and the person who's had their money stolen said, well, where is he spending it? Is he buying a new Mercedes? Is he getting a new house, a beach house? Is he putting an addition on his house? Like where I got to, sh- where's the money? Follow the money. So he gets a call. He meets with his client who had fly- flown in from China, but they met at a Panera bread, spoke to the man, took tons of notes, he gave him some information about what he knew about the man, like, and very routine. Then he called two other NYPD guys who were retired detectives who were now private investigators to help him work on it. He spoke to two federal agents about the case at the time. One was a, you know, had worked in money laundering in the federal government. And he said, this, I think this could be a good case maybe for you. You know, it's a, it might be a good case for the, fe- yeah. for the feds. Right. But he didn't pursue it anyway. The federal guy, um, so this was just routine, and he went and met with them again at a, a lawyer's office my husband was working out of, took notes, did some surveillance, notified the local police that they were there every day when they were doing surveillance, you know, reports, told them they were armed, had, you know, that what they make a model of the car. He parked about a half a mile away from the subject. Um, he did some asset searches which showed money laundering, and there was purchases of homes, cash, and all that. So, And he just gave it to his client, 
and never thought about it again. Kind of did a report. You know, he did invoices for everything, cash, whatever he got paid, paid out his guys. He made about $5,000 on this case in total. And then four years later, they, the FBI comes to our house and arrests him at a pre-dawn raid in front of my kids. So that's it for the, the Sunday State of Mind. Um, next week, you, it's, it, you're gonna, not going to believe what uh, you're going to hear. It's an incredible real-life story. Uh, and just tune in. Please tune in because you don't want to miss this one.